to the Copy Blogger Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. As you may remember, last week we made a joke that we're going to come in and just hit record so that we can capture some of the gems that Ethan and I talk about before we officially start the podcast. I cut Ethan off because there's a real quick testimonial that I want to shout out. One of the YouTube comments from the episode that we did with Matt is pretty amazing. So here's the comment from Kia Tour 259. It says, Matt is super interesting, but the interviewer is really annoying. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's harsh. Kia Tour 259. Harsh, man. <laughs> that harsh, same thing happened. <laughs> so a bunch of us were at uh, Inbound last week, HubSpot's yeah. big conference. And yeah. Sam, I guess they had a speaker cancel or something like that. So they asked Sam, like last minute, they're like, hey, can you go do an extra session on the big stage? Which is not, you know, it's not a small ask. Yeah. And he, he was happy to do it. He stepped up. Him and um, Darmesh ended up having a great conversation up there. But somebody on Twitter was like, I like Darmesh. I, uh, he's like, it was like, I like Darmesh a lot. I'm not a fan of Sam <laughs> or, or something to those <laughs> words. And I was like, ow, oh, man, that stings. <laughs> Um, ow, bro. But it's so funny because right underneath it, I know that you listened to it. And in that episode, I remember giving an example where he talked about how a newsletter is just going to keep niching down. And I talked about how I was going to start a newsletter for behavioral healthcare uh, professionals, which you and I have talked about before. And so on that note, Avivit, I, I'm almost positive that's her name. She's a part of my membership community. She's great. And so she says, this episode was a gem. I actually have a newsletter geared towards therapists. Specifically, the open rate of the emails is pretty decent, but it's a lot of work. Either way, appreciated the episode. And so it's like those two right on top of each other. And it's so nice. funny how, you know, there's some random avatar with no picture, right? It's just a blue C with the <laughs> username. Like, it's key a tour. <laughs> it says Matt is super interesting, but the interviewer, me, is really annoying. <laughs> and I saw that shit. I was like, oh man, I can't wait to shout that out on the podcast. So uh <laughs> thank you, Key A Tar two five nine. I appreciate your insight. I'm just like, you're welcome. Yeah. Me, uh, <laughs> you're this welcome. me on my week off. <laughs> Yeah, I guess you got to have some of those. Like, I actually think about this a lot. Who is it? Is it Nassim Taleb who talks about like something along the lines of your greatness is defined by the greatness of your enemies? You ever heard of this? He talks no, about this sometimes. I'm actually just reading his book. It's so funny you mentioned that. I downloaded um, not anti fragile. What's what's the other one? Um, skin oh, in the game. Skin in the game. I yeah, yeah that's a great one. It's brilliant uh, so far. He's so good. We should talk about okay. This is why we just hit record. It's because when we just, you and yeah. me just chat, cool things come up. He's got this thing. I think it's in Anti-Fragile about how, uh, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to butcher it. But that's kind of the basic idea. Your greatness is defined by the greatness of your enemies. Meaning, if you have no big people taking swings at you, you're not doing anything very big. Yeah. And, dude, I think about that all the time. I, I felt like I understood the point of skin in the game. And this makes you want to read Anti-Fragile as well, because like, I get it. Like your, Im your immune system is anti-fragile. Like the more stress mm -hmm. you put on it, the stronger it gets, right? And so I thought I understood Skid in the Game where in my head, I could define it in a sentence where it's you, if, if you don't have a piece of the upside, then it doesn't matter. But so far, what he's actually saying, which is way more important, is it's not about having skin in the game on the upside. It's about having skin in the game and the negative consequences. Yep. Like, oh, wow. Like that is a totally different viewpoint because now I'm a pretty, I'm a capitalist, not because I think it's the perfect system, but because I think it's just the, the fastest way to progress. And I think all the downsides of capitalism, which there's, there's basically three of them. There's, monopolies right like capitalism naturally tends towards like the ratcheting of resources to a select few which i'll try to be brief because i don't want to go on a tangent here it's just a little bit of context for the book but in my mind that's worth it because although that does happen what anti-capitalists forget to mention is that the whole 
of society rises disproportionately than it would have otherwise, right? So like, yeah, the resources do funnel to the top, but even the bottom is way, way better. You know, like I, you'd rather be poor today than be King Louis, who's like, you know, didn't even have a toilet, right? So there's that. And then there's externalities, basically, which is that capitalism doesn't make the people pay for the secondary costs of their products and services create, you know? So like if you're a plastic bag manufacturer, that's great. And you're creating jobs, but somebody else ends up paying to clean up the great Pacific trash reef. I forget what it's called. It's like the size of Texas, Mm -hmm. you know? And so like, that's an externality, which in a perfect world, capitalism would make the plastic bag manufacturer clean up all the shit. And so in the book so far, with skin in the game, his argument isn't that you want to have a piece of the upside where, I I mean, it's not, not that right. Like it it is part of it to where your reward is based on the success of an outcome, but it's also that like you are on the hook for the negative consequences Mm -hmm. that come along with that outcome or the failure of that outcome. And um, that's that's totally made me start rethinking some of these really strong opinions I've always had about about capitalism and like seeing some of the flaws in crony capitalism. And so, and so this is something I've just always felt real passionate about. Where with the pandemic, it bothered me so much that the airline executives got bailed out because the airline executives were the ones that kept buying back all of their stock over and over and over again. And in my view, it's like okay, if if you're going to share in the upside, then like the the exchange for that is risk and Mm -hmm. so how come their risk doesn't count but their upside counts you know and so you know i get into long debates with family members because i got family members that work in the airline industry and and now after reading that like i feel even more strongly about that opinion than i did before yeah i really liked the you said something interesting which was uh, if you don't have a piece of the upside it doesn't matter and i think that statement contrasts really nicely with the actual point of the book that you're getting at which is if you don't yeah. have a piece of the downside your 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 point of view uh, your point of view doesn't matter mm-hmm. like what i think is so interesting about his take on skin in the game and and for people listening if you haven't gotten into Nassim Taleb i i listened to i think almost all the books he's written this is skin in the game anti fragile black swan they're all sort of part of a series that he wrote which yeah. explores sort of the same set of ideas And I would say, based on my experience of them, anti-fragile is the best overall summary of all those ideas. And what's the other one? Um, Oh, uh, Fooled by Randomness, where he talks about statistics. So the whole whole idea, or sort of the high-level ideas that he shares, there's a couple of them. One is that, you know, humans aren't very good at understanding probabilities, so we don't make very good decisions based on actual risk, Mm -hmm. right? Um, And... He was vocal all the way through the pandemic about different ways of thinking about risk at different points. And I'm not going to pretend to fully understand his point of view on what was said publicly at that time, but he's a really interesting person to look at because his whole spiel is about understanding like what is real world risk and how do you hedge against it? And anti-fragile is this idea that there are some systems. So some systems are fragile, meaning they will break if they're put under certain stress. Some systems are robust, meaning you can beat on them and they won't break, but they don't get better from the stress. Then there are some systems that are anti-fragile, and that's kind of what he defined as a system that gets better with stress. That book is kind of the best encapsulation of all the ideas. And then this concept of skin in the game, which he talks about in several books, is this idea of kind of reverting to a hero type culture where the people whose opinion matters uh, are the people who have skin in the game. Like we've gotten away from that. We've gotten to a point where it's possible to have a lot of sway without having very much exposure to the downside. And that's what you're talking about with airline executives. Or, I mean, you could make the case that certain, like the pharmaceutical companies um, through COVID, they were protected from that downside risk because government signed whatever documents that protected them from getting sued that would be an example of pulling skin out of the game in certain aspects i mean 
Now, it's obviously a very complex situation, but his whole idea know. is that in a world where – actually, I don't know. How would you encapsulate the full idea? I kind of – I tend to think that he prefers a situation in which the people – who are making decisions have exposure to the downside risk of those decisions. Is that a fair way of kind of summing up what he's saying in that book? Certainly. I think a really easy understanding is, and I only thought of this because I finished my how to take over the world binge. And, you know, I've just always been a history nerd, but like the president of the United States isn't on the front line, but Alexander the Great was literally on the front line swinging a sword. And mm -hmm. so Alexander the Great had true skin in the game where his ass was on the line. Whereas, you know, we think of not even necessarily leaders. We, we, we think of, um, of, of outcomes, like who is in charge of, of being responsible for the outcome. Yes. But we've skewed our perception of it where we think it's noble that you, you are rewarded in disproportionate you are disproportionately awarded, rewarded for the upside that you create, but you're always hedged against the downside that your decision could potentially um, lead to. And so, yeah, man, it's it's totally, I shouldn't say it's changed my opinion. It's really made me rethink some, like, some obvious understandings of the world around me that I had. Yeah, th I think one thing that it changed for me was, I use it now as a decision-making framework when I'm trying to figure out what to pay attention to and who who to kind of give weight to inside of any particular situation, especially when there's a lot of unknowns going on. I think it's a pretty good, crude tool for deciding who has the highest likelihood of speaking the truth. truth. Totally. Yeah. So, And that can help a lot in this day and age when things are so complex, you know, like we talk about how do you like, so for me at work, we're always trying to pay attention to trends and kind of differentiate signal from noise. How do you do that? There's a lot that happens, I think, subconsciously, and we're still working on kind of bringing to the surface a lot of the frameworks that we use in order to pull that off. But one way I think is to try and discern who is out there talking and is actually exposed to the downside. Yeah, because they're going to have a different take. It's also interesting, man, not to believe the point. I, I could talk about this all day. I think Me it's too. a really fascinating study of human nature. But we were just talking about this uh, with some friends recently. Have you ever seen these articles about like billionaire preppers? You know, like these guys who have compounds and stuff like for that? For sure. Yeah, for sure. So what I think is really interesting is that behavior, a lot of people look at that and they'll they'll get concerned, right? Because they see, oh, well, these guys are smart. They've been right about things in the past. Like, I don't know, I heard that Kiyosaki lives on like a, a you know, a, a, if it's an island or it's an estate or something like that, where basically it's just a bunch of rich people with a whole bunch of guns and like self-sustaining properties and stuff like that. Or what's his name? Tucker Max published something very publicly recently. Well, he basically said the same thing. He says, you know, I, I see the world going to hell in a handbasket. So he's going to build a compound. If people look at this and they see these people who like have been successful in business now going out to do these things. And they're like very concerned. And I used to be too, until I realized that that mindset of hedging against risk is just an, it's an extension of the exact same thing that made them successful in business. For sure. It's not like any particular insight that's super noteworthy in most cases. What it is, is in order to create large amounts of wealth in a lot of cases, maybe not all cases, but in a lot of cases, one of the most important skills you have to develop, or I should say in order to keep large amounts of wealth, yeah, is the also. skill of hedging against your downsides, mm -hmm. right? Or identifying asymmetric risks and then just eliminating them. And this whole concept of like being caught unawares when society goes off the rails it's like the biggest asymmetric risk of all because you know what does it take three days to die of thirst or something like that mm -hmm. huge risk and it's you know that's all the chips it, you don't get you don't get a second chance after that so i think a lot of people look at this and they and they see these preppers as like paranoid or they worry that they have some special insight and i'm like i don't think it's either one of those things man 
it's just the exact same behavior that helps them keep the family money too. It's like you look for what is the biggest looming threat. And then if you can spend a finite amount of money to like put some water tanks in the backyard or yeah. whatever, <laughs> like, oh, okay, there goes that risk, right? That's all they've done is just hedge their risk. So it, it all it's all sort of swirls into the same thing. And I think Nassim is one of the more interesting people who explores that. Yeah, me too. It was fascinating. Before we started talking about this, there was a reason I told you press record because you actually said something else. You're like, <laughs> I'm doing, and I'm like, we should talk about that. All right. What so, was the thing? Uh, earlier today, you said that you wanted to revisit an article that I wrote that we've been teasing. And then I said, getting this morning's article out was tough, but I was proud of it. And then I said, I can't believe I'm still doing this where I'm publishing an article and doing my newsletter every week. And you said, you know what? Hey, record. Let's talk about that. And then <laughs> here we are. And then it's, minutes it's 20 later. minutes later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, okay. Why don't you just talk about that for people for like a minute? Because you are now what? I think it's 30 months. Weeks. Yeah. What does that mean? How many? That's eight. Wow. Eight months. Right? Yeah. I get that I right? Almost exactly. <laughs> Damn. Okay. Yeah. Eight months in. Uh, article, video. And newsletter uh, every the videos single week, right? are recent because okay. I needed a video in every newsletter. Mm -hmm. And so I was spending so much time trying to find the perfect video that I just said, screw it. I'll start making them myself. Um, I'll make the perfect video. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Because, <laughs> you know, I know everything. But so, no, the, the video is is probably two months. But yeah, sure. Like we can throw that in there. Blog post, which man, I used to write twelve hundred word articles and think like, geez, this took forever, and they're at like twenty five hundred words pretty routinely, which is a lot, man. Like it's a lot. And then the newsletter itself, a lot of it's curated, but I would say there's probably eight hundred words of like original content in each newsletter, and then the video. So, what is there to say about it? Look, I have some questions. Sure, talk to me. Okay. How much how much of this is done during the Friday panic? <laughs> a lot. <laughs> so I've gotten into a good habit actually of because the time it takes to do the newsletter is just a lot of tinkering. It's a lot of clicking around, right? Like the podcast is already kind of done. Uh the slot number three is basically that that's the most original. Um slot number four. I'm selling ads now. So for the past three weeks, slot number four is done for me. Slot number five is the video. Slot number six is like a business trend, usually on a macro level. Slot number seven is copy blogger. Slot number eight is like a fun, lighthearted thing. Sometimes it's even just a hysterical joke. Slot number nine is a graph that I like. And then slot number 10 is my final thought, right? Wow. Um, so on Wednesday... Not Thursday, not the Thursday scramble. Let's call it the Serenity Wednesday, right? On Wednesday, I started just taking the shit that I found on Twitter and putting it in ConvertKit and just itemizing it. So I think I think probably half of the newsletter is done on Wednesday. And then Thursday, I keep telling myself, I'm going to get this whole thing done. This is going to be great. Friday is going to be a breeze. <laughs> <laughs> Has that not panned out? The way that you thought it was going to pan out? Yeah, man. There's just <laughs> something about my personality that that like thrives on the, oh, shit, I got an hour left. And I'm not saying that's a good thing. I'm definitely not saying you should do it the way I do it. It's just, uh, I don't know. It just, it it fuels the fire. And I'm on like a routine now where I'm waking up at four in the morning, like on, naturally every Friday. And I just, time for the Friday panic. It's It's so... So ridiculous. Um, but yeah, I'd say I'd say 40% is done on Friday. Okay. So this is interesting. One of the reasons I wanted to talk about this for people is uh, one of the things that I think I always appreciate when other creators do is like they break open their process and sort of just be transparent about how chaotic it all is. Yeah. And so I think the thing that has impressed me about your process is that it, you're very regular in terms of Every single Friday for, would you say 32 weeks now? Yeah, 31. Right? That's impressive. That's tough. But I think what often gets missed is the other part of the equation, which is like, it doesn't, it's not like, you know, Tim in a high ivory tower with a quill, like planning the newsletter for the week. No, no it's the Friday panic. Every single, uh -huh. every Friday morning just kind of like gets pulled together at the last minute every single week. 
And I'm honestly, I'm the same way in a lot of my work. And like, and I don't know if that's a personality thing or not. I tend to think it is. I think it's a personality thing. And I also think I'm getting to the point where I'm just going to stop trying to fix it. You know, me like too. Just, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Cause I have certain coworkers who are crazy good at writing way in advance, right? They'll submit pieces, you know, three weeks out and they're, it's, it's really clear that they've spent like two hours a day researching and writing and it, they're incredible writers. And I wish I had that type of work ethic. Alas, I do not. So yeah. for me, everything tends to come together like at the last possible minute. And I think there's something to that. Like what it really is, is that this thing which needs to get done can't encroach on other areas of your work. I think that's exactly it. Talk, yeah, talk I really through this do. with me because I want to get my head, I want to wrap my head around this idea because I'm, I'm still not sure what, it, what I think about it. But it is a priority for me to do this. But it is also a priority for me to work out every day. Mm -hmm. It's a priority for me to go to my Muay Thai sessions on Tuesday and Friday. It's an absolute priority for me to take my sales calls and close as many deals as I possibly can, no matter what. And, and it's just, it's not an optional thing that I have in my life. And so it's like, okay, I remember Michelle Obama. I think I even brought this up before on the podcast. Um, but it was a moment that really stuck with me where she was obviously people remember she was like very in shape. And especially for a first lady, she was the first one to wear like some of those sleeveless dresses and her arms were, were super cut. And uh, she was being in a magazine or something. I can't remember what it was about her workout routine. She said she works out at 430 every morning. And they're like, Oh my God, how could you possibly do that? And she said, well, if I had to take a business meeting, at 4.30 every morning, I would just do it. And I wouldn't think about it. So like, how come when I'm doing something for myself, I'm not willing to wake up and do that? And that's, that's really how I think about it. Like, this is not a thing that my life depends on. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not, I'm only responsible to myself to get this thing done. Whereas some of these other areas of my life, like I'm very responsible to other people. But if it was... I don't know if somebody said, hey, if you wake up at 430 in the morning every Friday and spend two hours talking to me, I'll give you 200 bucks. You'd be like, oh, God, OK, I'll do it. But like when there's no instant reward, we won't do it. You know, and so when I heard Michelle Obama say this years ago, it, it really stuck with me. I was like, wow, like why are I should say, why are we? I should say, what is like the evolutionary kink? that we have that says like, I'm willing to do this if I get something out of it right now, no. but I'm not willing to do it if it means like suffering for a while in the future. And, um, and yeah, I just, I made the commitment. And so that's the time I have to do it. And that's just what I got to do. Hmm. You know, it's really interesting about this. So the thing that I keep thinking about is how the task changes over time, because early in the week, it's, it's one of those things that's important, but not urgent, right? And this actually ties in with the article that we wanted to discuss today. But you lay out that, you know, four quadrant decision making uh, model, which a lot of people are familiar with, and which we'll talk about a little bit more in a little bit. But, you know, it basically breaks things down by are they important? And are they urgent? Yes or no. And what's interesting about this is that things move across that board. Right. So this is like important, but not urgent early in the week. And then all yeah. of a sudden you get to a point where it's important and urgent. And I think the urgency is sort of self-imposed because you've created a deadline. Right. So that goes to show you that you theoretically, you know, wherever you put the deadline, you can turn something into you could turn something that's important into being important and urgent. If you are like sufficiently self-motivated to create a deadline that like you believe. But why don't we use that? as a transition point to talk a little bit about this uh, article that you wrote about how to never I think we were joking about how to never be wrong what is it called how to be perfect how to uh, always make the right decision how to be perfect that's the one yeah, yeah. <laughs> endorsed by Tim's wife as perfect, <laughs> perfect decisions that's what they call them well man I don't know if if like you set this thing up that way but you're you're absolutely right where that is the lens of which I view it. 
because doing this article and doing my newsletter is not urgent. Like I've manufactured urgency just because I put a deadline on it. But mm-hmm. in reality, nothing is riding on this other than a future upside, mm-hmm. you know, whereas the short term things that we talked about earlier, like that kink in, in our evolution, the short term things makes it so that like, okay, this has to be done right now. This has to be done right now. But it's, it's, it's funny how the way to actually achieve like long term success, especially in business is to kind of punt all the things that need to be done right now and deal with the consequences of them not happening and focus on the things that will pay off in the future. And so that's where that like urgency importance uh, matrix that Stephen Covey designed is, is so, what's the word? Like if you follow it, it's, it's like guaranteed to work. It's okay. It's interesting. Let's, let's, we'll, we'll get into it. I want to start by talking about this article that you wrote and I'll break it down from a high level. We don't have to go through every single word, but there's, I, for me, this broke down into like three pieces and you can tell me if this rings through. So the first section of the article is all about like, and, and again, the title is how to always make the right decision or something. So basically what we're, what we're talking about here is an article about not only how do you make good decisions, but it's like how is, I, I really felt this was a piece about how do you make the best decision about what to spend your time on and totally. in any given situation. And that's yeah. complex, obviously. But I, I would say that this piece kind of broke down into like three sections. So the first was like defining the problem. What is it that you're actually trying yeah. to do? The second is maybe defining like the level of importance of the various pieces, because that's where you kind of dug into this Eisenhower matrix or whatever it's called. And then the third, and I, the one that I think is like top of mind most for me right now, because I learned a difficult lesson in this recently, is knowing what you want. Right, because it's going to be really hard to determine what's important or what's urgent if you're not even sure like where you're going. Right. Yeah. So those are the three kind of segments for this. Why don't we start by talking about defining a problem a little bit? Because, well, I'll let you. I'll let you take it. You guys have an interesting way of doing this at Stasi, and I was so glad that you pointed this out. I think it's the most. Well, I think it's one of the most important parts of the equation. Well, I think it's the easiest one to miss. And I think most people spend a lot of their time solving problems that don't exist. And in most cases, I'm using these words carefully because I don't want to single anyone out or make it seem like like people are incompetent. It's it's mostly like a self-defense mechanism where looking directly at the problem makes things binary because you either solved it or you didn't. And the unfortunately, that is a self-defense mechanism that is pretty outdated because we don't live in a pass-fail world anymore where if you went for the jump and you didn't make it, you quite literally fall down a cliff. Like that doesn't happen anymore. In in our world and our society, there's always an adjustment. There's always a pivot to be made. And so, and by the way, taking a step back, this is all very like evolutionary psychology type stuff, which I just find so fascinating. I, I, I know I've talked about this before, but this whole idea of lizard brain and the Seth Godin stuff that totally just changed my life where we can't help it. Like our, our brains are designed to exist like 500,000 years ago, you know? And so it's very difficult to change your your brain chemistry to adjust for a non-binary decision making. And so when you focus on the actual problem, you can get the most bang for your buck on the decision. And it makes all the other decisions basically irrelevant. I mean, it's not to say that they won't have an effect. It's just that the cost benefit analysis for solving the problem that matters most pays off so much more than solving some of the other problems. And so what we do at Stazi is we, this is a derivative of Tim Ferriss's why thing, which I'm sure he got from someone else, which I'm sure that person got from someone else. If you just ask why after every answer you get, you eventually find the original question, you know? And so for us, it's like, what's the problem? Well, this is this and this is the problem. It's like, okay, well, what's the problem with that? 
well, this and this and this is the problem. Okay, well, what's the problem with that? And most of the time you get to like the fundamental problem where solving that problem solves all the other problems. And if you're interested, um, there's a video on YouTube. There's a brilliant scene from, and the YouTube video is in the blog post, by the way, which we'll link in the show notes, but there's a really brilliant scene from Moneyball, which is the movie with Brad Pitt that um, talks about the system of baseball that the Boston Red Sox used to win the World Series. It was actually invented by this guy, I forget his name, who developed it for the Astros, I think. And it's it's all mathematical. You're not looking for the best players with the best numbers. You're looking for very specific skills to be filled. And there's a meeting where they're talking about what to do and like the the players to recruit for the next season. And he says this, like, what's the problem? And they say, well, we lost this person. It's like, okay, what's the problem? Oh, we lost this person. And I was like, I know what the problem is. And it's like, okay, what's the problem? And nobody can actually answer the problem. And the problem was that they didn't have any money. Like (laughs) that was the only problem that they needed to solve. They need to figure out how to fill these positions with no money. And, uh, and so like, the exercise, it's a complicated thing to talk about, right? Because it's not like a one size fits all type thing. The only suggestion I can give is this exercise that we do at Sazi, where we ask what's the problem over and over again to get like a couple layers deep. But I'm telling you, unless you know what it is you're actually trying to solve, then it's what's the expression? You're, you're walking you're east looking for a life. sunset, right? Yeah, well, I, I so this was an interesting piece of the article to me. I wanted to talk a little bit more about how you view this through a leadership lens because I think a lot of people listening will definitely agree with you that picking the right problem to solve is the most important thing, especially a lot of engineers who hear this, software yeah. developers, those types of people. They can all relate to this. And a lot yeah. of them spend much of their career frustrated with colleagues who jump into problem solving mode before defining like what the real problem is. But, you know, despite the fact that many of us know this is an issue, I think a lot of us still kind of deal with the problem with the deal with this uh, frustration of people jumping straight into problem solving mode. And I think a lot of that comes from either forgetting like ourselves to pause or uh, sometimes it's tough if the leadership doesn't seem to support this like type of thinking, right? Because sometimes it feels like stopping the team in order to really define the problem. It takes guts the first couple of times. And then after a while, just speaking from personal experience, sometimes you start to worry that you're like the person who's the naysayer, right? Because Mm -hmm. everyone always wants to throw in ideas. And you're always kind of saying like, whoa, 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 whoa. Before we do anything, let's get really clear about what we're doing here. So how do you think about this as a leader at Stasi, like creating space for this conversation to happen? Or um, yeah, how does this play out like within the team dynamic for you guys? We train it from the top down. It's part of our company culture. It didn't start this way. This was an adjustment, right? When we all lived in, in Florida together and we're in the office together, we used to have Monday meetings and it was it was easier to talk about that because we were all learning as we were going. You know, it's easy to sit here on a podcast with you 12 years later and act like, oh, come on, this is obviously the way to do it, right? But <laughs> like, believe me, it, it wasn't like this forever. And so we've, the leadership, I should say, there's three of us in particular. There's me, my partner, and there's Trisha. And Trisha... Um, for lack of a better word, she's the president of the company. Like she runs, she runs the day to day, and so we've we've developed this on our own. But now, especially with COVID, with uh, just the being remote lifestyle, you have to drill it because you can't be there to have these subtle conversations with people. And so we, it's part of our company culture. Like we've we've generated a, a a culture manifesto, I guess you could call it. It's not gimmicky and it's not some shit like Zappos where we all hang around and like, you know, hold hands and have tech parties and stuff like that. It's it's just we just know. Like we say things like use your brain. Like what why are you asking me this question? You know, like come yeah. on. Use your brain. Like stop it. Figure it out. I don't really know what the answer is, but just use your brain. You have one and use it. 
say that all the time at Stati. What's the problem? What are you actually talking about? It's like, no, 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 that, that's, that's not what you're talking about. That's just what you're feeling. I don't care about what you're feeling. Like, what's the problem? And then let me know when you have the problem. So, um, so yeah, th- those things have just been, they, they've slowly, the, the company has slowly absorbed these ways of thinking, which makes it so that it's obvious now, but it wasn't obvious the whole time. Trust me. Hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. And um, what about in terms of onboarding new employees? Because the thing that I'm thinking of, here's the way that I think about this. I see this skill as existing on a spectrum. And I know it does because I've seen people who are pathologically incapable of like very specifically identifying the problem and tackling it. And then I see people who are so good at it that they do it almost without even thinking. Uh, Example of that would be Steph Smith. So Steph Smith, one of my colleagues at several companies now, she's now over at A16Z, is she seems to be able to work on the most important thing without even really, and she may disagree with this, but as from an outsider's perspective, it looks like she doesn't even work hard to identify what the most important thing is. Just Mm -hmm. seems like she's like incapable of doing anything other than what is going to like drive the most significant outcome, right? Like very, very good at identifying what is the actual thing we're trying to change yeah, and then only work on that thing. And as you say, kind of punt the rest, right? So speaking of punting the rest, that kind of brings us to the next stage here, which is identifying like, okay, assuming you know what the problem is that you're even trying to solve, the next step is creating, I guess, what would you call it? A plan for what you're going to actually spend your time on. So you mentioned this Eisenhower matrix. There are some other ways of thinking through this, but I want you to talk for a minute about this concept of like, you said punting almost like what doesn't have to get done and just Mm -hmm. deal with the consequences of that. Yeah. Tell me about when that really first sunk in for you as like a business owner. It sunk in when... I was dealing with a client who was very difficult. And the client was a friend of mine, which, again, I learned that lesson. And it wasn't eight and nine from last week, by the way. I would work with that guy anytime (laughs) because he and I are boys. Uh, So it was more of an acquaintance, you know, somebody that I had a personal relationship with. And this guy was always, always emailing me. And I just, I remember even being a little, Um, impressed with his emails because you could feel the sass in his emails, but they weren't so deliberate as to be rude. Where like I, it never left an opening for me to go back and say like, "Hey, man, like you don't got to really talk to me like that." Because they were so professional that there was never an opening for that. But you, you just knew like he was he was digging at me a little bit, and he always wanted to be the most important person in my company. And I remember replying back with an email and thinking to myself, this is a complete waste of my time because all the time I'm spending on this is time that I could be spending on on something else. And this was probably six months after I read that book in my old office. Um, I used to have a bookshelf on my desk where I would keep some of the most important books that I would randomly just open and flip to a page and, and remind myself of some of these lessons that I was trying to learn to to become an entrepreneur. And um. That that was the moment. Yeah, that was the moment when I, I I saw from firsthand experience that there actually was such a thing as urgent but non-important actions that I was taking because there was so much urgency around it. Because if I don't do it, like, oh no, this guy's gonna quit. This guy's gonna quit. And we, and we were small back then, right? Like every client really, really mattered. But it, it was so not important because it was the last thing I should have been doing with my time. Where I think that's a, a a pretty good framework to view it through. Because if you punt all of the annoying emails that you have to send, that's probably, I don't know, let's call it two hours a week that you could save. And if all of those emails got ignored, you'll probably lose a client. And you'll lose an annoying client who's going to save you time in the future, right? So if you ignore all of those emails and you spend all of that time doing nothing but making relationships and doing outreach and doing sales calls, 
Mm-hmm. Sure. The short-term consequences are that you feel anxious. You're ignoring this guy who's probably refreshing his email every second, waiting for you to reply. You know, when's he going to get to me? When's he going to get back to me? I'm the most important person in his whole company. And you're worried that you're going to lose that revenue, which you really need. But six months down the line, you're probably going to have two or three real clients that you've cultivated organically because you spent that two hours a day doing important, not urgent work. Mm-hmm. And so it's like <clears throat> saying it is one thing, fighting the angst that the stupid part of our brain is develop is uh, has evolved to do to survive is strange because the stupid part of our brain makes it like no i need to eat right now because i don't know when i'm going to get another chance to to get this kill right to get this hunt i don't know if this is going to appear in the future but that's not how we live anymore and so if you can just punt that shit down the road and focus on the urgent or excuse me fo- focus on the important not urgent stuff you're it's always going to pay off in the future mm. Yeah, this is something that I have always struggled with. And I think it's an area where there's not a, there's a lot of common advice, but there's not a lot of great advice. You know what I'm saying? Like a lot of the advice is you got to learn how to say no to stuff. Yeah, but that's stupid. Yeah, it's hard for somebody, especially somebody who's like earlier in their career where I actually don't think that applies as much. Like I, I actually think super early in your career, uh, it's a huge mistake to say I totally no agree. or to even focus on like trying to figure out no and balance and all that stuff. So yeah. I, but I, but I feel like I'm just getting, I, I really liked the way that you phrased this <clears throat> where you said, you know, the key to success is, and I'm paraphrasing here, but basically punting the important things down the line and just dealing with the outcomes of that. I think there's a few things that have to happen before that becomes something that really sinks in. And this is just from my experience. So this is what's helped me with this recently. As I said, one, I think you have to be deep enough into your career that you are getting to a place where you feel like you can say no to things. And what I... and you'll know you're getting there because before that you go through this period, at least one, sometimes several, where you're just completely overwhelmed Mm -hmm. and then you have to hit the gas even harder, right? And harder. And like you have to, you just go through these like several iterations of doing as much as you think is possibly possible and then more is asked of you and then somehow you find a way to do even more. And then somewhere in that, you're like internal talk starts to change because you realize a couple things. One, you're actually capable of a lot more than you thought you were early on. Two, you're you're in demand because people keep asking you to do more. And so this is a thing that I've found for me changes over time. It wasn't something that I was just good at. And I in some ways, I think I'm still learning and I don't feel like I'm really great at this yet. But what I can point to the things that had to happen first, and I know that through the early part of my career, I was not good at saying no to anything. And I don't think anybody should try to be, right? Then there's these eras of uh, complete overwhelm, which help. Um, And then I think, what am I trying to get at here? Yeah, those uh, periods of being asked to do more and more are just very helpful for like figuring out what it is you want to focus on. Uh, I lost the original thread of what I was trying to get at. No, but I got it. I I think that's right because it's subjective. So if we would have taken that same experience and put it two years into the future, like it would have been, or excuse me, into the past, it would have been important for me to answer that guy's email, right? Because, Because your circumstances are different. But in that scenario the urgent, not important thing would have been my friend calling me on Tuesday night saying like, Hey, there's something, something happened and you got to get here right now. You know what I mean? You just reminded me of the other thing. Okay. So this is what I was for people who are like, what happened to Ethan? I'm, I'm, I forgot this point. This is the other thing that I think needs to happen. Right. So you need to get to a point where you're deep enough in your career. You go through these stress periods. That's definitely important. And then you said something that was so crucial you have to start experimenting with doing the things that are important and not urgent. And the reason for that is 
you can't think you can't think your way into success with this but in doing those things you will start to experience the type of upside that can only come from them yeah and in doing that it's going to become way easier to say no to the unimportant stuff because yes. rather than constantly checking off to-do lists you sit down in the morning and you or like like you did you commit to sending your newsletter once a week how many times do you have to do that before you get the kind of like feedback client growth traction where all of a sudden you realize well yeah it is important you don't consider it to be crucial but it's the thing that continues to drive the flywheel in such a way that it is more important to yeah. get that done during a week than that you answer some of those emails yeah you know so like you have to invest the time on those things that are important and not urgent a couple of times i'm talking like two to three reps two to three publications right i think that's enough when you're you're going to start to get a little bit of a feel for what the potential upside of those things are and then eventually that helps really root it in your mind that oh my god there's actually way more potential on this side of the equation then there is, I'll never get to the bottom of the checklist. You never do. But if you just keep checking off that one thing every single week, it doesn't matter that you never get to the bottom because that thing brings asymmetric upside. Yes. And one more point on that, but you just said the bottom of the checklist, which is actually a perfect transition to the third part of this article. So don't let me go too far into this. and We'll, we'll forget that. But I think the distinction to where you cross that chasm in your head where you start to see like, okay, these important things with asymmetric benefits in the future, what's so difficult about that, and this gets into my spirituality a little bit. I know it's hard to see the connection, but but the reason why I think I have been able to do it is because of my definition of the word faith. Because of my recovery and just some of the experiences I've gone through, this word faith has come along in my life a lot. And so it's a strange word because what the hell does it mean? It can mean so many different things in so many different contexts. And I've thought a lot about this. And to me, faith is believing that what I do right now will show in the future. That's all faith is to me, right? Like if I, if I hit a gas pedal, I have faith that I'm going to be 10 feet further down the road than in, I don't know, two seconds than I am now, right? Like it's, it's a very linear way to define it. But what else could it be? Like you just, you have faith that the thing that you do in this moment reveals the manifestation of itself sometime in the future. And it's been easy, I shouldn't say easy, it's been easier for me to act on faith as I've gone through some of these experiences in my life and, and, and just learned some of these lessons. And hmm. so for the point that you just made, if, if someone's listening to that and they're thinking like, oh, well, cool, but I'm still here, you know, answering all these client emails and building my freelance business. And like, when do I get to the point where I can take a step back and start to, to work on those things? It's hard to put that into a really quantifiable answer, but the the mental and maybe even emotional gauge is that lesson of faith where like, when are you at the point where you're going to start believing that the things you do today are inevitably going to show up in the future? And it's hard. It's a, it's a journey of self-discovery, but you know, it's one that you got to take. I, okay. I like that a lot. And I would add one more thing to it, which is like, when are you going to get to the point where you start believing, truly believing that the unimportant stuff that you're doing today yeah. is never going to end. Yeah. There's no bottom to it. This is the other side of the equation. So I, I'm glad you brought up the four, you know, quadrant thing because it's a it's it's a popular mental framework that I've struggled with a lot because I don't have a very easy time differentiating between urgent and important. Like those mm. are very similar terms to me. Mm. So I've always struggled with that, but I recently kind of stumbled across a different way of thinking about this, a visual way of thinking about it, um, which actually happens to line up like quite well with the matrix. So I have this recurring feeling that I am that, like, I'm sitting at my desk, right? 
when I think about how I spend my time, it's like I'm sitting at my desk and there's all these things coming at me, right? Some of them are coming from work and then some of them are coming from like personal projects. There's things that I want to do. And the image that I stumbled across in my head, which has been really helpful for me recently is like for a long time, it was like I was sitting at an L-shaped desk and on one side of me, I was stacking all the things that I wanted to do someday, right? Mm. Like write this book, uh, start this website, you know, just all those important but not urgent things. And I would I would pick them up and go, wow, this is a great idea. And then put it on that side of the desk. And meanwhile, where I'm actually spending all my time is on the other side of the desk where there's, there's all this meaningless bullshit coming and going and coming and going and coming and going. Like, you know, just the tasks, the checklist yeah, stuff, yeah. right? The stuff that never ends. And so the way that I really feel is like, I feel like I'm 32 now. I feel like I've gotten to this point in my life and I've got this pile of stuff now over here on the other side of me that I've always wanted to do and have not taken the time that I should have taken to do it over the last, whatever, 20 years. And so it's just been piling up. So rather than having books that are published or websites that are up or income streams that are coming in, it's just like a big pile of ideas that I've always wanted to take action on. And I'm tired. Like I'm, it, I'm tired of it. Right. So the way I think about it now is when I'm sitting down to do something, I, I think of it as like left side or right side of the desk, which, which side is this task belong on? And if I find that I'm spending too long without doing anything on the left side, like the fun side, the stuff that I just want to do just for the sake of having done it in my life, then I will stop whatever I'm doing, even if it means I go broke and just spend an hour on whatever that thing is on the left-hand side, right? Like that, right? I mean, recently it's been editing the draft for a book, right? And just like, or certain trips that you want to take or whatever it is, left side, right side, left side, right side. So left side is kind of the fun side. The right side is all that stuff that never ends. And what you find, I mean, the more time you take for that fun stuff, the more that tends to go right, yeah. I have I have yet to run into a problem where something seriously bad happened from cutting down on the amount of time spent doing tasks. And the upside from just taking action on those few things that like the back of your mind keeps telling you you should be doing, the upside from that is just so huge that again, it's just a couple of reps, but you start to get the reward, and then it becomes easier and easier to say no. And I really feel like it's one of those things that you got to start because you'll never find the time. You'll never find the time. You have to make it first. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, perfect example. I love that visual. And never finding the time. Let's let's move on to section three here because, <laughs> yep. well, it, it all like, comes together really well because it's it's all related, right? And it's all part of a daily struggle where the solution is the same always. You just have to learn how to apply it. And so for someone listening, thinking to yourself, oh, well, that's easy for you to say, right? But I have to go to the grocery store. I have to take my kids to soccer practice. I have to pay the electric bill. I have to whatever, whatever, whatever. Like they're all urgent and important things. But a non important, not but an important non urgent thing might be, okay, fuck all of that stuff. I'm going to hire somebody to do it for me. And you think, whoa, 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 whoa. I, what, what do you think? I'm just made out of money. I, I can't do that stuff. But it doesn't matter because you're investing on faith in that outcome in the future where now you have, have all of this time to do the stuff that you want to do. So like... <laughs> It really, really does. Have you heard work. of credit cards? You can just fill them up and throw them out. I don't know why more people don't <laughs> yeah, do that. Yeah. <laughs> Have you heard of debt? Just yeah, stack just, it up. Man. Just stack it up. You guys, you heard it here first. No, I, there really is something to that. But you know what? You you actually pointed me to something else though too, which I, I would actually. It's been really helpful for me, and I will share it here again for anybody who's going through similar things. Because I feel like I'm just coming out of a season of this of feeling completely overwhelmed, completely torn in too many directions, way too much to do. I had said yes to too many things, right? Yeah, you did. And one thing that helped a lot, you mentioned Tony Robbins' time of your life thing. Yeah. And That's I the ultimate so, outcome. Yeah, I got it. And, and exactly. So you just said the word right there. So for people who are struggling with this, I have this to do and this to do and this to do and this to do. One of the breakthroughs from that class that I really liked is that he says, well, 
take a look at the tasks and tell me what outcome are they related to for your life? Because you might find that a few of them are actually related to the same outcome, or maybe you could change. And and so if a few of them are related to the same outcome, then you could like batch them all together and do them all at the same time. Or some of them might, you may be able to change the task, but get the same outcome. So like, if you have to take your kids to soccer practice, maybe, maybe that's more related to like an outcome that you have of like having a happy and fulfilled family. And there may be other ways to take action on that without actually being the person that drives them to practice or something like that. Mm -hmm. But he advocates this focus on outcomes rather than tasks. And dude, I'm still learning this, but there was one week in particular where I had like three days back to back to back. I was like, I was super busy at work, super busy with social stuff. And like, I, and I, I remember going into it being like, I really just want to be present for all of this. You know, I want to be. I want to be, I don't want to be thinking about the next two days when I'm at dinner with the family tonight or having drinks with colleagues or at the bachelor party or whatever. And so I start with that outcome first thinking and then kind of work backwards from there to figure out what do I actually have to do on each of these days in order to make sure I'm getting these outcomes specifically, these like emotional outcomes and these whatever physical outcomes, the, the actual things that need to be done. And there was, I mean... I'm still practicing, but there was that one three day span where it just worked perfectly and it completely, it was enough that I now know what I'm shooting for. I know what I'm trying to replicate more and more often. It's such a powerful way of thinking. It's extremely powerful. And this idea was even more focused by a lecture from Jordan Peterson that I think I mentioned before, where he talked about aim and he talked about the importance of aim in humanity and how aim is developed even in our physiology where our eyes and the way our ears are shaped the fact that we look forward as opposed to other animals that that look to the side the fact that one of the first things we do is learn to throw things and we don't just learn to throw things we learn to throw things at targets the fact that all of our sports is basically about aiming at something so Mm -hmm. there's something in our dna that well it's about hunting right uh it's about having a target and aiming at it and it's it's a it's a lecture that i heard years and years ago a little bit before jordan peterson kind of went on this like uh, i don't know where where he's at right now but it was very helpful to me and the idea is that you can't hit a target if you don't know where it is it's so simple it's so mm-hmm. freaking simple but i think so many people spend so much time throwing balls at a target that they can't see. And they just think, if I just do this, something will happen. If I just do this, something will happen. Like my day is coming, right? My day is coming. But you're not going to hit the target if you don't know where it is. And if you do, it was by accident. And the problem is sometimes people hit these accidental targets and it makes other people think like, oh, that's all you have to do is just keep doing a whole bunch of everything. <laughs> like. <laughs> But you mentioned probability in the beginning of this podcast, right? I like to think of everything through a lens of probability because there's there's no such thing as absolute certainty. And so the probability of hitting your target is like 10 gazillion X if you know where your target is. And so knowing what you want, if you know what you want, every decision you make can be based upon will will this get me closer to or further away from my target? That's it. I, and that's that's really it. <laughs> can I, I yeah, I think it's so important. Can I add something to that that is not typically added inside of this context? This is something that I again have been working on recently for myself. So I came like I I've sort of alluded to this period recently and I have to stay kind of vague because it's just like there's several companies involved, big projects that are not necessarily like publicly yeah. disclosed at this point. And the company that I work for is publicly traded. So I'm never sure what I can totally say in public. But I had been saying yes to too many things. And I learned a few really important things about this concept of learning to re- recognize and be very clear about what you want. Now, this is sort of strange for me to say because goal setting has always been a big deal for me. But I would say over the last couple of years, I've let it go a little bit. And the reason I let it go is uh, in part because... I 
I think there's probably a few things. One is I like I just I really like where I'm at in my life right now. I mean, there's things nice. that I, I want to continue building and improving. Yes, but I also just really genuinely like what I, I like what I do for yeah, work. I like feel good. I spend time. At. Yeah, I feel like I've I've achieved a certain level of success in what I've set out to do, and so that like hunger to get to the next level isn't as pronounced right now as it had been in the past. There was also a thing that I dealt with for several years when I was younger, which was like really severe anxiety. And in getting through that, what you learn very often is like how to let go of expectations because that's what anxiety really is. It's a lot of certainly it's a, it's, it's a lot about expectations of what's about to happen. So you learn to give some of that up. And I think I went through a process of like dissolving a lot of goals and stuff almost out of a survival technique it, more than anything else, just because that was kind of how to manage panic attacks and anxiety and stuff. And so in a lot of ways, the season that I'm coming into is a season of relearning how to define what I want and to go after it as the type of person that I am now, which is like somebody who's like integrated all these new skills in terms of being able to deal with anxiety and fear and like what that does to you. So for a while, I gave up this skill set of being very clear about what I want. And I'm relearning it now as a new type of person in a new place in my career. And one mistake that I made recently, or like the the reason that I'm relearning it is because it doesn't matter how far into your career you get and how much success you achieve. There, If you don't know what you want, you will still create misery for yourself. It's just mm -hmm. a different type. So in my case, I was in a situation where I had too many great opportunities in front of me and didn't know, wasn't clear enough on what my outcome was in order to be able to pick the one that, or two or three or whatever, that would have the highest likelihood of getting me to where I wanted to go. And mm -hmm. so instead, I said yes to everything, right? And I genuinely don't think I say yes at this point because like, I don't do it out of a feeling of pressure. I feel like I have a lot of opportunities and I, I feel like I could say no to things. I also don't have a hard time telling people no. Like I, I respect people enough to say no, but I was at this point, lots of opportunity, not clear on what I want, said yes to everything. And let me tell you, it is as miserable, if not more miserable than having very little opportunity. And I know because I've been in both those places. So when you say that you got to know what you want, I want to impress upon people that what I'm learning in my situation right now is that, that is, that's a thing that doesn't go away. It gets more important to Certainly. define the further you go up because you're going to start getting access to opportunities that are way, way bigger and the yeah. stakes are bigger. And you're, you're, the need for you to say no in order to not screw up bigger and bigger projects is bigger, right? It doesn't go away. You just trade up. So that's one side of it. And the, the other thing that I'll just say about this in terms of like, being able to say no, I think this is something that a lot of people, this is not usually included in this conversation, but I would say that the ability to say no and to really trust yourself that you can say no when you mean no is probably one of the most important undervalued skills for happiness. And the reason for that is this, I've come to believe that a lot of people will self-sabotage because they're afraid of success just as much as because they are unclear on what success looks like. And the yeah. reason is, and I found myself thinking this, what if I get it and I don't like it, right? Mm -hmm. Like, what if I get there and I hate it? Now, the people that I admire the most, they just say, wow, this sucks. And they walk away and they go do something else, <laughs> right? Because they're like totally comfortable in their ability to feel like, ah, oh, no, this is not really what I want anymore. And they'll just yeah. go do something else. You need that. You need that, I think. Otherwise, there will always be some part of you that won't trust success and will keep you from taking shots on it. I don't know what goes through your head when I say that. I think it makes perfect sense. It's it's sunk some cost stuff. Like having an acceptance that you went for something and it didn't turn out the way that you thought it would, and just being perfectly fine with that. It's probably more difficult for people to talk about because who wants to admit that they got what they wanted and didn't like it, but probably every divorce attorney ever, you know, <laughs> like, like lots of doctors and surgeons who didn't realize that they're going to be working like a hundred hours a week and sleeping in the ER. 
all of us, we've all gotten what we wanted and thought to ourselves, oh, I thought I would feel differently. Yeah. And then learning how to expect, I shouldn't say expect, learning the realization that that is always a possibility and doing it anyway. And then just being able to live with the outcome, it's probably just a, a sign of maturity, you know, and, and we all get there when we get there. But, but some people don't, you know, like I, I can think of a few people who don't. And so they self-sabotage because they think it's probably not as good as I think it's going to be, you know, like, or like, what if I get there and, it, and it's a letdown? But, yeah. Uh, or like, what if I get there? And I, like, so the thing that I think of is what if I want out? Yeah. And then I can't get out. Yeah. Which is why you need to be able to trust. That's why I say you need to be able to trust yourself to be able to say no or like, or like, Hey, I'm done. This is it. I don't want Mm -hmm. this anymore. All those types of things. Because until you can say that you, what I, the way I say it, this is for me, this was like a big thing about anxiety too. I always say like, until you can trust your no, you can never trust your yes. Hmm. Because I think that a lot of people who struggle with anxiety, I certainly did, a big piece of that was saying yes to things that you didn't actually want to do. So you say yes, 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 yes to please a whole bunch of other people until finally your body shuts down. And yeah. it's like, nope, no, you find a way out because I'm going to, I'm just like going to have like a panic attack, right? So you f- you figure a way out. You figure a way to say no. You don't think you can say no? I'm going to make you say no until you can finally say no in like any situation. And then- you can start to trust your your yes again. Yep. It's the most important skill set. That was a great line, man. You can't trust your no, you can't trust your yes. Because Yeah. Same for other people too. Like I say this all the time. It's the same thing. It's like I can't I can't trust your yes if I can't trust you to say no as well. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like relationships, business partners, all those things. It's more important. And you I think a lot of people are, you know, would agree like you want people who can just be honest with you and like, don't try to protect exactly. my feelings. Like, don't do try you to respect don't... me enough to say no to me and yeah, not people exactly. please me. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I think this comes back to the earliest part of this conversation in terms of like defining problems inside of a team setting. You need to know not only like the, that leadership prioritizes making time for defining the problem, but also that people all the way up and down the chain will say what they actually think the problem is. Mm. Even if it's, hey, I think you should have prioritized this more as a (laughs) leader, you know? Hey, I think you are completely (laughs) wrong. (laughs) Yeah. Man. Cool, man. Yeah, great freaking episode. Um, I got to wrap this thing up now. I got to go take my daughter off my wife's hands. But, man, great episode. I loved it. Thank you for being so honest and raw about all that stuff. I feel like we... I'm personally coming away with a lot of gems from this one, so I appreciate it. And uh, thank you to everybody listening. We'll talk to you next week.